Today on Dead Dodge Garage, we start growing our own revival projects in-house. Mm -hmm. This is the garbage can Cuda. The tractor is for scale. Longtime followers may recognize this car because, well, I've done three videos on it, I think. Those were all at the other shop. Uh, when I still had the other shop. This car's ping-ponged its way around our friend group um, several times, actually. I first got it eight years ago. And then again, two years ago, and then again, like two weeks ago. My no longer partner Jordan was the most recent owner of this car, and it was supposed to go back to Utah with him. However, I want to keep it around here, you know, so we can keep seasoning it with our uh, lovely Pacific Northwest winters. But also, so I could build it for you guys. Oh, also because sentiment's a bastard. Eh, despite looking like total garbage, we've actually done quite a bit of work already. Under all that dust and grime is brand new engine compartment paint. We touched up the fender wall header openings. Touched up the fender wall headers, although they certainly need some more. Rewrapped the harness after fixing it. And threw the brake lines away just for fun. For reasons unknown, we removed the horrible carpet to expose all of... This stuff. <sighs> okay, great. Oh yes, and the seats were junk. So now we've got these from the middle row of a Volvo XC90. Maybe in another year or two, all of this paint will fleck off and this wheel will actually look kind of nice. Jordan got way too excited scraping the letters off the dash. I mean, what the heck? I have a vision for this car. And that vision is sitting almost how you see it now when the engine's back in. The three inch side dump pipes it used to have, definitely needs that. Reblacked, less ugly, less texture, and some vintage race sticker action here. My vision also includes tires that are a little wider to hopefully get some traction, which this car is not known for. And maybe, just maybe, an axle which will hold together um, when uh, the car's doing this. So, yeah. Here is a pile of CUDA parts. In previous videos, we put a lot of elbow grease into getting the engine components finished. But at the last minute, instead of just, you know, honing it and throwing the pistons back in without looking at the bottom end, we decided to look at the bottom end and all the bearings were Schotsky. So, we've been waiting for bearings. Oh. Now, I believe all I have to do is... Yep, it's done. Put it in the car. Here is the parts collection for the CUDA. There's even a new water pump. Totes full of things. Radiator options. A shiny air cleaner I painted and detailed. An intake too. The heads are all like done with new springs and wrapped and I mean even the balancer is all nice. Crank's clean. Although we'll clean it again. Yeah, this, this looks awesome. I guess I just gotta put it together. We're basing this build around this lightly used thumper camshaft from the demon parts pile. It's Big. Probably too big, actually. But it's a stick car with a 410 gear. Eh. What's the worst that'll happen? And for the first time ever in my life, matching valve springs to the cam. This is just going to be too good. The performer intake was street magic on the original 360 in this car eight years ago. That one had out of rock heads and uh, a slightly smaller cam, actually. And uh, yeah, it did cool stuff. So for now, at least, we're going to retain this thing. But we did match the ports. Wow. And yeah, it looks like crap. But that's fine. It'll work. Oh, surprise, surprise. Everything in here smells like cat pee. Yay! Oh, yes. The party piece of the garbage can Cuda. Really crappy, beat to hell, fender well headers. Awesome. Now, 
As someone who just closed a shop that originally at least specialized in building engines, I am equipped with all the measuring equipment I could possibly need to double check things, which is what you should do. However, I'm probably just gonna throw the bearings in and put it together. It'll be fine. Okay, it's time for quite a bit of this. Ah, a can of brake cleaner just doesn't go as far as it used to. Hey, make sure you get all the uh, crap from honing out from those weird spots, because it seems to collect there. There. It's not just good, it's good enough. There's quite a bit to know about building an engine, but like many jobs, it's almost more important to know what you can get away with. Like original can bearings, for example. They look fine, everything's going to be fine. One thing that is very important with an engine, keep all the parts in order, carefully, point in the right direction, etc. Uh, need a hammer. One other important thing I'd like to say, there are a thousand different ways to do this, and mine is not the right way. It's just a way. I used to work at my local O'Reilly Auto Parts, and when I applied for that job, there was a question that said, what is your mechanical experience level? The highest was, I build engines for fun. I took great pleasure in poking that box. This is very fun. It's one of the most rewarding things you can do. The first Cuda motor, oh, that was rewarding. That was the first engine I built. Although I had to build it twice. Rule 17, clean everything. Especially things that look clean, because they're not. There aren't a lot of tools you need to do this job. A torque wrench, a hammer, a screwdriver. I like to have a speed wrench, your standard cruising model standard socket set, and well, torque specs help. Did I say clean everything? Clean everything. Even the backside of your new bearings. Everything. Oh, also, no oil on the backside there. None. Do not do that. Don't. Bad idea. Bad stuff happens. Now, this varies by bearing set, but uh, some of them will have grooves in the bottom and holes. I say bottom, but top. The ones that go in the block. These guys. <laughs> They'll have grooves and holes, but then no grooves or holes in the other section. Some will be full grooved, but with no holes. And some, every single one will have a hole, so it doesn't matter where they go. If they have an oil hole, they go in the block. If they don't, they go in the cap. Did that make sense? I think it's time for more coffee. Here is why we decided to replace the bearings. They don't look the best. Incidentally, the crank's in really good shape, so yeah, it'll be fine. Ah, oh, man. And if by some chance the crank is not fine, it's fine by now. I have more. Did I say clean everything? I feel like I did. Hey, just so we're all clear here, I'm not teaching a master class on engine building. I'm just documenting, I guess. You know where I learned to build an engine? YouTube. I bet you can find the same video. Anyway, if you pick up a couple useful tips and tricks from me, awesome. But um, may require additional knowledge and books. I should be building this engine here, but uh, yeah, the shed will have to do. Now, following on to the there's a thousand ways to do this uh, theme. Oh no, I didn't sit in right. <sighs> More on that in a minute. Anyway, um, there are various lubrications you can use to get these bearings happy before dropping the crank in. You could use assembly lube. There's all kinds of stuff. But uh, I like engine oil. Using engine oil, the crank will spin free, and you could feel if there's anything wrong quickly. So that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm hoping to have this engine running within a month. That might be optimistic. But uh, anyway, engine oil should be fine. Eventually, it might leak out of there. So if your engine's going to sit for years, use something different. The crank is carefully installed. Now, in case you do get your caps um, out of order, they should be numbered. Hopefully they are. And in case you get the orientation goofed up, just look for the little tang. The bearing goes tang to tang, which means it goes <coughs> that way. It's just hard to do one-handed and blind. 
Don't forget two little dabs of silicone here and here, or you're gonna have a bad time. Do make sure it doesn't actually get on the crank. Just a little bit will do. Here's a small but absolutely essential step. Once upon a time, I sold a 360 to a gentleman who rebuilt it. I later brought it back and he told me, well, it's all rebuilt, but uh, when I tighten the crank bolts all the way, the crank won't turn anymore. So I kind of left them loose. Now I fixed it with a hammer. With the bolts loose, tap every one of the caps lightly. See it seat there? As it does that, the ends of the bearings are gonna straighten themselves out and everything should be all good. Don't go ham with this. Brass hammer's a nice touch, but you know, any smooth face hammer will do. Did I say start the bolts first? Make sure you start the bolts, then give them a little tap. Make sure they're lined up right. As you're doing this, you wanna pay attention to every little thing. That cap, when I tapped it, was rocking back and forth. I pulled it out, reseated the shell, put it back on, and then it tapped right down. I could tell the hammer sound was wrong on that one. It should get a nice solid thunk when it's seated correctly. If I torqued those bolts down as it was, maybe it would have been fine, but maybe not. Just pay attention. Now let's run the main bolts down with this fella. Yay! Can you use an impact for that step? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I've done it before, but it's really nice using the speed wrench. You can feel every one of these bolts going in the motor. If something feels messed up, stop. Anywho, they're snug down. Every main engine fastener goes in three steps to its maximum torque. These go to 85, so I'm going to do something like 30, 55, 85. Why not? We'll do the first step, 30 foot-pounds, and then there's one more thing we have to do. Oh yes, it's good practice with these things to go center out. Crisscross like that. Make sure they go evenly. Before we get too excited going to the next stages of torque, we need to set the thrust. The middle bearing on this engine, rear bearing on some other engines, and well, who knows? But anyway, main bearing three has the thrust washer surfaces. You can kind of see them in there. We need to scoot the crank back and forth to make sure they are together and straight. And here's how you do that. Don't go too crazy now. And back the other way. Now we'll go 5585 with the old torque wrench. And then we'll make sure it spins nice and we'll check the thrust with the mag base because why not? Speaking of good practice, you should go back and double check every bolt to make sure it is in fact torqued. Unless it's an angle bolt, but nothing in any engine I want to work on is an angle bolt. Also, if you're an airhead like me, you should mark every bolt after you've torqued it. Moment of truth. Does it spin? Oh, it does. Ow, this is hard to do with the gear. Maybe I should get a socket. Here's how you check your crank and play. Oh, ah. Yes. Okay. It looks like five thousandths, I guess. Let's just say that's fine. I can't tell you the spec for your engine or well, even for my engine, but uh, I know you want a little bit, but not too much. And too much is, I think 15 would be like a lot probably. So uh, yeah. Well, I guess now it's time to make an assembly that rotates. Oh, that's heavy. After much, Digging and tiredness, I think, found the important stuff. Yay! Why's the rear view mirror in here? Story time. When we took the pistons and rods out of this engine, they were numbered backwards. One, three, five, seven were on the passenger bank. Two, four, six, eight on the driver. I have a theory about that. Looking at these pistons, a lot of them have um, valve contact marks. I think someone put it together wrong in the past, and someone else noticed. Anywho, I'm gonna put them back where we found them. In case you find yourself wondering if your rod bearings are bad, if they do this, yeah, eh, they're bad. Welcome to several hours in the future, where it's like 15 degrees hotter and I'm tired. What was I doing? Oh yeah, pistons and rods. 
You need some sort of suitable cylinder lubricant. Fish oil works pretty well. Of the eight rod bearing sets, not all were loose enough to just fall out. These four were fine. These two were pretty bad, and these two were atrocious. Now, incidentally, the way I have this laid out, numerically, that's the front of the motor over there. But now I'm wondering if they had flipped them that way, so one and two were in the back. Does that make sense? The only thing I can think is heat. Those two were dangerously close to stripping the tangs out and spinning bearings, but they didn't. So that's good. Just weird stuff. Yeah, most of these were having bad times. And for the record, they're Clevite 77s. Same bearings I'm putting back in, so it's not like they were poor quality. <sighs> okay. Now, if you lose your way putting the rods and pistons in, everything's all uh, in a pile or something and you need to know how they go. Valve release, that way, if you have them. Like the uh, previous builder of this engine, I have figured that out the hard way. That's fine. Anyway, on a Mopar, you also have, on the cap, a handy little squirter. That should point at the opposite bank. It cools and lubricates the opposing cylinder. And your tang should go toward the oil pan rail this way. Any of those things can help you make sure you're pointing the right direction. Here's a cute little trick. If you just moved your engine building stuff and you can't find your journal protectors, chunk a hose looped up around the crank and cover both of those studs. Help keep you from whamming them into the crank and uh, scraping it. Okay, ring compressor installed. Time to give her the old tappy tap tap and it'll drop right in. Or it won't. It'll catch one of the oil rails. Just a little annoying, but you gotta pull it out and rig it again. Not a big deal. Because I turned the camera off, I have literally got it in one hit. Oh, and in case you're keeping score at home, yes, I'm reusing the rings, reusing the pistons. We did a cleanup hone. The only reason this engine was ever taken apart is because it ate a cam lub. And while it was apart, we decided, ah, might as well clean it up and give it a hone. Glad we did because we found a bunch of bad bearings. And now we're here. Well, we learned a valuable lesson today. Namely, that I cannot do all of these steps in order without forgetting anything and film at the same time. Also, I covered my phone in WD-40. Also, there's brake clean in my finger. Also, I covered my glasses in WD-40. Anyway, we'll use movie magic and fast forward to when all these are in there. Yay, we did it. I actually got every one of these to go in with one hit, except that guy. I think I was two. Now, if you've ever found yourself wondering if you could do this, I just did in a crappy falling down lean-to with an ancient ring compressor, some WD-40, and a hammer using techniques I learned on YouTube. And years of experience and engines under my belt, sure, but I bet you could do it too. Now, the order here isn't extremely important, but I don't want to roll the engine over seven times. It's hot. So I'm going to put the cam in now, which of course requires getting it greasy first. I wish I had some comp cam lube. I don't. So, uh, engine assembly lube's just going to have to do. The good thing is this has already been run and I have the matched lifters in order. So, eh, what's the worst that could happen? Now this job is greasy. It's not just good, it's acceptable, I guess. Hey, that looks good. It's even torqued and lined up correctly, I think. <sighs> Sun's getting all goofy, I'm getting blind here. Neat. Timing cover and balancer are on. The timing mark's even right. It's amazing. Anyway, now I'll torque the rods, install the oil pump, and we'll put the pan on. Then we'll do everything else. Rods, torqued. The sun is invading my work area. That's bad. Oil pump, yep, torqued. Time to install the oil pan. I wish I had a windage tray, but I don't. 
We did install a slight oil dam in there to try and prevent slosh. This is, after all, a straight line car. Yeah, we'll see if it actually helps. Well, it's got an oil pan, but this thing's gonna leak like a toilet that won't stop running. You know, Felper used to make good stuff. The rubber seal in the back, way long, didn't fit. Decided to fix it with silicone and sand it anyway. My rear cap has a little divot in it and the rubber pushed out through there. Trying to get that thing anywhere near seated, it split the cork. And I was tightening it with that, so I don't even care. Goobered more silicone on it. I never want to look at this thing again. I really need it to not leak though. Maybe I should use the rest of the can. I'm gonna pretend everything's fine and move on. And when it inevitably leaks, I'll do this one in the car, just like the demon. Yay! Lifter time, note. They're labeled L&R, 1357, etc. So they'll go right back on and everything will be fine. Honestly, probably better off than using new ones at this point. I will do some manner of engine break in. I don't know. It's better than not. When you're dropping your lifters in, here's what you want to see. Boop. If yours don't do that, uh, stop and fix it. Lifters are in. All of them went in nice and smooth. Now it's either beer 30 or at least water 45. Por que no los dos? Well, time for a momentous occasion. Clean the crap out of the deck surfaces and install the freshly reworked heads. Now, I am using some lightly used head gaskets on this deal. Uh, that's what I have. I'm feeling cheap. I spent $200 on bearings this morning. And that is the sum total of my excuses. Oh yeah, that whole knowing what you can get away with thing. Anyway, I do have an insurance policy to replace the uh, slightly modified tough one on these gaskets. Shun the non-believer, shun him. My shady area is getting tragically small. In case you're screaming at your screen right now about reusing parts on this thing, well, it only had like 10 to 15,000 miles on a fresh rebuild. I think it's fine. I'm gonna say it's fine. The real mystery is what the heck happened to those rod bearings? I hope I don't find out soon. Look at all this niceness. Freshly lapped in valves, mild port work, cleanup work, gasket match, new valve springs and seals. Now I just need to clean it again, I guess. Cylinder heads, yay. Uh, also, I was missing four head bolts for some reason. Luckily, uh, I'm a hoarder. It's been so long since we did this, I totally forgot we plugged the exhaust crossover. This is gonna run awesome. So, my next job was to make the adjustable rockers fit. Unfortunately, they're in Utah. So, I guess we're gonna run it with these for now. I don't even have all the parts to put the stock rocker arms back on because when this thing ate a lifter, it kind of hammered the push rod and we pitched it. Luckily, the demon parts collection is the gift that keeps on giving. Well, that ain't right. Eh, whatever. With all that done, it's time to put the icing on this cake. I'm excited. For the intake, what you want to do is throw those thingies away and make and seals out of, well, the right stuff. Look at this. Sure, the valve covers are just sitting there, but still, it's beautiful. And it only took all day. Look at that, the icing on the cake. I even found a double pumper core, finally. Man, the lighting is awful and there's no room around this thing at all, but uh, hopefully you can tell how much elbow grease went into making all this happen. Now, obviously, there's plenty more to do. Hoses, and water pump, and alternator stuff, valve cover bolts. Really need to get those adjustable rockers in there at some point. And T-handles to get in and check them would be 
A really nice touch. More on that later. For now, I'm gonna sit back and admire this thing. It both is and isn't major progress on the car. I'll take the small victory and I'll take a cold snack if you're handing them out because it's been a day. The sun is setting in the sky. Sweaty mechanic says goodbye. Don't worry, guy, your day is coming and soon. Tune in next time when we figure out all this and put the car together, I guess. Hey, thanks for watching. And remember, grass tastes bad.